14, the president of Nigeria at that time set up the Victim Support Fund, the Presidential Committee on the Victim Support Fund, as a rapid response, private sector-led humanitarian institution to be able to provide psychosocial support, economic empowerment, education, and rehabilitation and resettlement for victims of insurgencies and terrorism across the northeast of Nigeria. And in the last six years, the VSF has done incredible work um, across the northeast. In fact, I made bold to say that, aside from the United Nations and a couple of other international agencies in Nigeria, the Victim Support Fund is perhaps the most prominent uh, private sector, the most prominent humanitarian initiative that you'll ever see in the Northeast. So if you travel from Meduguri to Bama to Goza to Jetete to Daluri to all of those places in Borno, or if you go through Askira Oba, or you're going to Potiskom, no, Askira Oba is in Borno, but if you're going through Buniyadi in Yobe, in Adamawa, if you're going through Michika, Madagali, and all of that, you would see VSF boards you know, schools built by VSF, school furniture built by VSF, health centers, um, hospitals donated by the VSF. Um, and these are not things that I was told myself. These are things that I, I mean, I, I've seen myself. I've traveled to these locations. Um, I, I remember that in 2016 and thereabout, I, I was seven months pregnant and I went to Michika, Madagali, to commission the, to lay the foundation for the rebuilding of the local government and the police, uh, the police um, station that was destroyed by Boko Haram in Adamawa State. So um, the VSF has been doing all of this work in the last six years. And this year, the COVID-19 pandemic broke out without any sort of notice to anyone. And um, let me just mention that when President Jonathan set up the VSF in 2014, General T.Y. Danjuma was um, appointed our chairman. And uh, Mr. Fola Diola was our vice chairman at the beginning. But later, Alajiti Dani Tumsa became the vice chairman of the VSF. Now, on the 30th of March this year, General Dan Juma uh, called an emergency meeting and said that you know, he's very worried about the COVID-19 pandemic and the outbreak. And there's a lot of uh, tension in the urban areas. And he doesn't think that anybody's going to remember the internally displaced persons, uh, the poor families of ho and households across the country. So he really wanted us to go and intervene. And we asked him, did you want us to focus on just the Northeast? He said, no. Because, yes, Boko Haram insurgency is predominantly in the Northeast, but coronavirus is across Nigeria. So our intervention has to be able to take, account, take into account the religious, ethnic, tribal, you know, social status considerations you know, amongst our citizens to ensure that nobody is left behind. The moment we got, our tax force got inaugurated, the first thing we started to do was research. Um, because research and development is extremely crucial in targeting um, you know, initiatives that have to do with resources, mobilization, resource distribution, resource allocation, um, especially to vulnerable persons, many of whom are not very educated, uh, are extremely mobile, um, do not quite have a lot of, um, you know, skills in terms of reporting, you know, what we, we may want to, many of the, our beneficiaries don't speak English, for example. Uh, they're proficient in many things, but um, they may not have the sort of opportunities that uh, some people in the other parts of the country do have. So we started to research. We, we allowed the monitoring and evaluation department of the VSF to start to find, you know, research to determine what are the things that were going to be, that are going to be needed in the middle of this pandemic. So that, you know, we needed a needs assessment to guide how we were going to expend those resources to ensure that we are provide, we're actually meeting the need of people rather than simply just dumping whatever it is we assumed was their needs upon, you know, on, on them. Found? We found that number one, food remains a big challenge in this country, pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID. We began from Abuja. From Abuja, Abuja got about 20% of the one billion air budget. And we donated food, so we broke, it in, we broke it down into food, medicals, and PPEs. For food, we decided that we were gonna do rice, beans, maize, because, of the, because it's the North and um, salt and vegetable oil, four liters. So all of them were bagged into a 50 kg bag. Each of the food items was rice 10 kg, beans 10 kg, um, maize 10 kg, vegetable oil was uh, 10, four liters, and salt was two kilograms. And then for medicine, we broke it down to primary care and secondary care. Under primary care, we, we, um, we gave out basic pain medicine, analgesics, paracetamol and co. We gave out anti-malaria. 
we give out um, basic multivitamins because the immunity of our people is very important. It's very important in the middle of this pandemic. With low immunity, a lot of people are going to fall prey to the virus. Under the secondary care, we focus on anti-diabetes and anti-hypertension uh, medicine because we realize that um, people that are 50 years and above are more vulnerable to coronavirus. And we didn't want mortality in terms of, the, you know, in terms of those that people within those age ranges in the IDP camps and within the communities were intervening. So, um, and then we also donated um, medical equipment like speed manometers and glucometers for people with diabetes and hypertension. And then we, we also donated hygiene and sanitation materials. One of the things that we also discovered was the very low awareness within, you know, of, you know, citizens within those communities and, you know, social strata of society. We went into, I went into Malkoi IDP camp in Adamasco. If you go to my social media pages, you'd see a picture where I was demonstrating social distancing. And we realized that at that time, there was a lot of, um, a lot of the awareness concentrated on urban areas. So a lot of the messaging was in English language. We were the first organization in Nigeria to begin to do coronavirus education in Hausa, Fulani, Fufulde, Pidgin English, Yoruba, Igbo, Tif, Jukun, and Idoma languages. Uh, one of the things that we, we uh, found out was that a lot of the messaging was very you know, fragmented. So you talk about social distancing without taking into account that there are nine people sleeping in one room, in one village in um, you know, Askira Oba, for example. You, you forget that the IDP camps are overpopulated in thousands. And how, how can people social distance? You were talking about constant hand washing under running water for 30 seconds. And all, only less than 40% of Nigeria's population has access to running water. So part of the things that we also invested in was risk communication management to ensure that the, the outbreak, because we knew that the people in the urban areas would take precaution. But the people in the local areas, if, you, if coronavirus, if one person contracts COVID-19 in one IDP camp, you know by the next morning 500 people have it. You're going to have mass mortality. And we were very scared of that. We engaged very strategically with the state governments as well. We worked with uh, Governor Zulum and Dr. Meru Mandara, who, heads, uh, the, um, who is the special advisor on, uh, yes, in Bornu State. Um, we, we advised them on the importance of, we have donated the soap, the detour, the sanitation materials. So we wanted them to build boreholes in the IDP camp so that people can constantly uh, wash their hands. We paid attention to the competence and the capacity and the character of the um, governors and the administrators within the states. Uh, we also paid attention to states that we understand are uh, actually poor and need, and that the, we wanted states that the impact of the VSF intervention would be visible. And you may ask me, but Lagos is a very rich state. Why did we come to Lagos? Um, Lagos State had a very peculiar case. Remember that I mentioned that we had decided that whatever it is we're going to do on the tax code was going to be in strategic alignment with the federal government's response strategy. Um, the federal government had declared a lockdown in Abuja, in Lagos, and in Ogun State. Ogun State specifically because of the proximity to Lagos. And we understood that for the enforcement of the lockdown to have been effective, people needed to eat, people needed to survive. And a lot of Lagosians depend on their daily income. So when you say people can't go out, if there's no food, they would actually go out. The more people go out, the more the coronavirus spreads. Especially also because a lot of people at the bottom of the pyramid didn't quite believe that you know the COVID-19 pandemic was real. A lot of them were saying that it was something that the government had created um, to be able to embezzle funds and spend money and raise international funding, support, and all of that. So we were extremely strategic and uh, deliberate and very intentional in you know every step of the way in the intervention, which is why I talked about the fact that research played a very key role in what we did. Institutional support is a very crucial component of the Victim Support Fund COVID-19 intervention. Um, we thought that while we were paying attention to the plight of citizens, we also needed to focus on supporting credible public institutions to be able to support and empower them to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic in a very efficient and in a very fast, measurable, um, and, ac and accurate uh, way. Data is extremely important in policy making when it comes to um, issues around uh, healthcare policy. And, um, and um, the NCDC is the federal government agency, the National Center for Disease Control is the um, federal government agency that started with the responsibility of you know, um, 
working around the research and the com you know and combating infectious infectious uh, diseases. So we had engaged the NCDC to try to find out. Like I said again, research. So I I had spoken to the I called Dr. Chike Hikrazu, and um, we had asked him what sort of immediate urgent support does the NCDC need at the moment that would be really useful for the for the agency to be able to, to fast track the response, especially in the face of social distancing and the new normal and some of the prevailing circumstances that were somewhat new, you know, within our our country and across the world. And uh, the NCDC had requested telesurveillance and um, telesurveillance and teleconferencing equipment, um, basically to be able to facilitate meetings and make sure that from Abuja, the NCDC is able to coordinate the entire, you know, healthcare response, um, COVID-19 response system from all across all the 36 states of Nigeria, remotely from Abuja. We're also supporting the Federal Ministry of Health with, um, we're providing technical support for the Federal Ministry of Health, um, specifically in the area of, you know, the Ministerial Advisory Committee, the COVID-19 Ministerial Advisory Committee uh, that the minister had set up to continue to provide advice and guidance. People come from different sectors, you know, basically to advise the, the Federal Ministry of Health, uh, support them. So, for example, information is very important. So people from the media or the Ministerial Advisory Committee to push out information from the ministry, you know, on a daily basis, Profe you know, um, professors, the people from the academia, you know, um, researchers, um, uh, you know, public, public health experts, um, you know, a lot of uh, different, you know, it's a mixture, it's a potpourri of professionals across board. We're providing them technical support. We're, we've been supporting the Mini Federal Ministry of Health Secretariat. We provided them laptops. We gave them printers to be able to, you know, facilitate some of the work from home and, you know, in, in, you know um, some of the work from home decisions that the ministry has made um, in the face of the fact that a lot of their staff may live far away. They may not be able to, they may have to work overnight. There may be memos that need to go out and all of that. We, we, we supported them with that. Um, in the th we are going to be setting up molecular labs in about four or five states in the next phase. At the very beginning, we focused on our priority constituency, the northeast of Nigeria, where we have the predominant population of in IDPs and you know, victims of terrorism. That's our mandate. So we immediately went to respond to the IDPs. We began from Borno, moved on from Borno, uh, Abuja, from Abuja to Borno, Borno to Adamawa, Adamawa to Yube, Yube to Taraba, and then we came to Ogu State, and then we came to Lagos. Uh, Ogu State suffers a very delicate you know, challenge because of the proximity to Lagos and the fact that they are also bordered, you know, they are the only state in the whole of the Southwest that's bordered, you know, on, uh, on you know, by four different uh, states. So uh, migration, you know, could contribute to the, you know, widespread of coronavirus. So we provided support for them, food, medical items, PPEs. The items were received by the Deputy Governor of Ogun State. In Lagos State, the items were received by the Commissioner for, for Agriculture. The food items were received by the Commissioner for Agriculture, uh, Mr. Gbola Lawa, and the Permanent Secretary for, for, the Minister of for the Ministry of Agriculture, Dr. Olayi Wale Onosoya. I mean, Yobe State were received by the Executive Secretary of the State Emergency Management Agency. In Taraba State were received by the Governor of Taraba, the Commissioner for Health, and several other people. And the items were received by the SSG, the Second to State Government of Taraba State. Um, in uh, Adama State were received by the um, State Emergency Management Agency uh, Chair and um, Executive Secretary. In uh, Abuja, we received by Mr. Idris, who heads the FCT Emergency Management Agency. Uh, from there, we moved on to Edo State, we received by Governor Basak himself. But the food items were handed over to the Honorable Commissioner for Health and the First Lady of Edo State, Mrs. Betsy Obaseki. A lot of the people in that uh, IDP camp came from Bornu. And so, um, a lot of, we had also previously supported the IDP camp. Um, we, we, many of, about 12 of the children that we supported to pay school fees for are now lawyers. They were, re, they were um, refugees from Borno State who had fled from Borno State and resettled in, in uh, Ohogwa. In all the states we went to, we, we basically focused on, we paid attention to a few key things. Number one, what is the existing, what, what measures have the governors already taken by themselves to respond to the pandemic? So are these responsible state governments? that already know, recognize the, the importance of being in an emergency situation and taking concrete action to responding you know, to, to the pandemic. Number two, are these poor states that actually do need help? 
Number three, are these states that need augmentation and consolidation on processes they've already set and put in place that, so that we can have something to build upon? Uh, the other thing was also to pay attention to um, actual poor states. We realized that it would help the accountability and the transparency mon and monitoring process of the intervention if we partnered with certain, you know, existential structures within the state. So we decided to go and our monitoring and evaluation and programs team in the VSF worked to ensure that we would get, um, we we're going to get the the, uh, we're going to be able to, so we partner with local NGOs, all right, and uh, the NGOs were verified. We signed legal agreements with them, telling them to tell us the specific local governments where they were going to be supplying our, um, distributing our food items and our medicals. We handed about the medical materials directly to the ministries of health. All our NGOs signed legal agreements with us at the beginning when we select them. We select them out of a pool of a ton. If you go to my page, you will even see that I always write, if you have any NGO that can partner with us, please send me an inbox message. We don't know many of the NGOs. In Lagos, we partner with some of the best NGOs who are already working in the COVID-19 intervention. So Cocoon Foundation, Lagos Food Bank, Mama Moni, uh, Gabasawa, um, a they sign legal agreements with us. We provide them some little financial support for the rental of trucks to come and pick the food from the warehouse to keep it in a particular place. We give them a timeline that must be deleted. All the items must be distributed within a specific number of days. Upon completion, all of them sent us reports. The names of the beneficiaries, they gave the food, their food, their phone numbers, their address, what they do at the local government where they are. If you look through the VSF portfolio, you will see that blind people received the items. Dwarfs benefited from this intervention. Women in the markets, old poor women in the markets benefited. Children, pregnant women, men that had no jobs, students. There's no category of society that we didn't pay attention to. We didn't just make donations. And we were conscious of the dignity of our beneficiaries. What we must factor in is that there's no single organization that can provide everything that all the IDPs in Nigeria need. And this is where private sector collaboration and the sincerity of the people that are entrusted with these resources come into play. With the amount of IDPs in this country, one billion is a drop in the ocean. VSF has empowered more than 150,000 farmers. Pesticides, fertilizers, I mean, go to the Northeast. The fertilizers, the pesticides. Bornu State government has done a lot. But if you go to Bornu and tell them that, apart from the UN and international agencies, which, sing which single organization has done the most work with supporting local farmers in the Northeast? It will be the victim support fund. I feel like I'm built to last. I don't take drugs. I take my multivitamins. I don't joke with them. I take, uh, I exercise. I read. You know, everybody has their own fetish. I'm very obsessed with finding new knowledge. I'm obsessed with breaking new ground. And I don't measure my existence by, I'm comfortable in my own skin. So somebody else's accomplishment is not the standard for me. I simply live my life at my own pace. But I'm not the first woman who will be able to juggle all these things. There are several of them. Because your conjurella has a husband and children. And is a very present mom. Same as Obiese Kwesili. Right? Same as Ibuku Awoshika. Bola Adeshola. Tara Fela Drutui. In Kaud, Makinde, several of them. My mentors, the people that have touched my life the most, uh, they're not noisemakers, as it were. They're people that are very grounded in substance. You know, and I, I, I keep saying that for every young, every young woman I meet, if they say, Mrs. Ogushi, deliver us with one advice, I'd say that the greatest career decision you'll ever make is the person you marry. You need a clear head to make a difference. You need a home to go to where somebody is willing to listen to your ideas, laugh at your crazy joke. I'm going to be traveling to the Northeast in the middle of a pandemic, double jeopardy. Boko Haram territory, COVID-19. We have two little children, four and two. 
My husband could have said, sorry, please, if you go, don't come back. But my husband said, these are the things that give you joy. Be careful. So you need a man who is secure. As a, as, a, as a woman who wants to be the type of person that I want to be, you must be teachable. No, no man wants to be the appendage of any woman. I, I as a woman, don't, don't, don't want to be an appendage. Where, where our marriage is a marriage of equal opportunity. Nobody is better than the other. But I recognize that my husband is the head of our home. I'm not contesting my husband's position. And my style of feminism is not to query the position of men or to compete with men. It is to understand my power as a woman and stay in my lane. I'm very passionate about women and girls. I don't use, I don't, I'm able to draw a line between my passion and my career, my family and my home. In my house, my husband is the head of our home. Our marriage is a marriage of equal opportunities, but we understand that we have a leader here. And I'm not contesting my husband's position. So what? Feminism means that you uphold a certain, types of, a, a certain type of values that protect that support, that recognizes the, leg the presence of women as legitimate members of, my, of, of the society. A culture that does not say that women are second class citizens to men. I am not a second class citizen to any woman, to any man or, ma or woman. I'm assertive as they come. I'm, I cannot be cheated. I cannot be put in a box. Everybody who has encountered me knows that. But I also don't allow so many of those things to stand in the way of reason. So I cannot have a female boss and be contesting vigorously with him because I'm trying to show him that I'm a feminist. That is not what I mean. All right? Feminism and respect go together. Feminism and reason go together. Femi feminism and basic common sense go together. And these are things that I want young women to learn. One of the things that I, I, I like to tell young people is it's okay to be different. A lot of young people don't know that. In the very early years of my career, I, as a fresh graduate from university, I was already working in the largest indigenous oil company in Nigeria. I resigned that job to go and start Rise Network. Not even to start Rise Networks. We had done the first Rise National Youth Forum, remember? And it was extremely successful. 2,000 young people in the middle of an NLC strike. It showed me that young people in Nigeria were hungry for something. And then I had to go and join YIC, and I got posted to Wando. And so I had a small office in VI where I used to go. So I go to Wando office in Anjosa Adeogu in the morning. I arrive at 5 o'clock. I lived in, in Orego. During my lunch break, I'll go to my Rise Networks office for an hour. For during my lunch break, I'll quickly take a bike and leave my car and go to my Rise Networks office. There are jobs that bring you comfort and convenience. There are other jobs that bring you real significance. The day I knew that I was right was the day the set of the Victim Support Fund and the president appointed Wali Tinubu and I to the same, <laughs> both as board members of the VSM. It's okay to be different. You fall along the way, you make mistakes, you have challenges, but um, you definitely make it good. My parents were not very comfortable with my decision, but I don't think, I've never looked back and thought that I regret some of my decisions. In addition to that, always pace out yourself. Learn new things every step of the way. That's how you become relevant. Otherwise, the world will forget you. You wake up one day and realize that all the people you started together I've moved on. Don't measure your existence by the standards of people. Our journeys are different. Nigeria is the best country in the world. I can't live anywhere apart from Nigeria. Nigeria presents an opportunity for growth for me than America does. There are no problems to solve in a country where you open water and the water is running where you see light every day and you need to almost go blind. Do you understand? You walk on the street everywhere is clean. You leave your bag somewhere, come back and meet it. Do you understand? 
What problems are there to solve? He didn't challenge my mind. Harvard is the best university in the world. Our system was almost perfect. Our classrooms, our professors, our curriculum, the content, everything. You can't live in an ivory tower bubble like that. You'll be destroyed in time. I grew up in a country where there's no water. We need to fix our water. So that Americans will tell me that, go back to your country. Nobody in Nigeria can tell me to go back to my country. And you see, I'm so, I am so, I cherish everything in life. My most prized gift is my human dignity. If you ever do anything that queries my self-esteem, I will revolt. I am not a candidate for any, any sort or representation of oppression or suppression. So an environment that presents me with opportunities to make a difference, to make a change. Yes, Nigeria is a struggle. But every day I wake up knowing that somebody just ate somewhere because of something I did. I want to be able to look back and know that I lived a very fulfilled life. If I live in America, I would have stayed there because of the comfort. I'm not even sure that I would have gotten the sort of compensation that I think that matches my talent. I used to say that I would run for office until recently. I'm rethinking it because of things I've seen and experienced. I haven't given up on Nigeria. I just think that the Nigerian system favors only a type of people. If you look at the people Nigeria favors, the answers are in the, they're in the air. I'm done with the politics of Nigeria. I'm interested in the governance, but I'm done with the politics. There are two ways to get into governance, by elective position or by selective position, by appointment. I would settle for the later right now so that I have an opportunity to demonstrate competence. Okay? Build, build public goodwill. Learn about the system and decide whether I want to go further in the system. But the composition of Nigeria today, Nigeria is a complete com country with multi-level complexities. It's not something that I'm willing to... We don't celebrate heroes. The people who, who do the great work for this country are rarely remembered. A country where thieves get chieftains titles and former governors who stole money get doctorate degrees. A country that doesn't, a country without consequences, where people know that for bad behavior, nothing will happen to me. A country of any how. I don't know if I have the strength, the emotional balance to superintend over such a system. So if I were president, I don't know, you know, I don't know when I'll be president, and I don't know if I'll ever be. And the circumstances at the time I'm going to be president maybe are definitely going to be different from what they are now. But the one thing that I know is that if we fix our education, if we fix our human capital, if we invest in security architecture, and if we focus on research and development, and, and when I mean research and development, it will cut across sectors, agriculture, oil and gas, energy, deep technology, renewable energy. Those are the things that make a nation thrive. And as a government, you put the power in the hands of the private sector and give them an enabling environment to get the work done. I want to be able to metamorphose into an inventor. I want to build something and endow it on the world. I don't want to be forgotten. I want children to hear that. I don't want to simply write reports or written documents. I want to create things. I want to be able to put together an Arduino board, a jumper wire, a potentiometer and build something that will be able to d check breast cancer in women so that we can reduce the amount of women that die because they found out early. The world belongs to the people who solve problems, not the people that talk about them. Right now, I'm very passionate about my data science. So the reason why I want to take a PhD is to see the, to be able to explore the inroads of artificial intelligence and big data into the Nigerian military infrastructure. I believe that a country's, a country's sovereignty 
is the most important. The reason why Nigeria cannot attract the quality of the foreign direct investment we should be getting is because of our insecurity. Do you know how much money will come into this country if we weren't talking about Boko Haram? Constantly, governments of countries are issuing security reports about how Nigeria is unsafe. And so we lose collectively when we don't pay attention to the, most, to the things that matter the most. So for me, what I want to be remembered for is to become an inventor. I believe that science is the foundation of the world, and it will completely transform everything. In the next 20 years, 70% of the jobs that humans currently do will be taken over by machines. And people are worried about how technology is going to take over their jobs, forgetting that people need to train those machines. The machines that the backward integration of talent and technology is what will really make us a great, great nation. And so I, I don't want to be forgotten. And I don't want to be one of the ways that you can really change the world is to build things that solve people's problems and change their lives. So we won't forget Christopher Columbus. We won't forget the three women that wrote the mathematical framework that sent the first American to the moon, which has now become a movie, hidden figure. We won't forget many of the inventors who gave us electricity. We won't forget the people that built injections. So that's how I want to be remembered.